Hello, my name is Lini Wallenberg, and I am pleased to be your host for this session, where we will now turn to the subject of soil carbon and its uh, the ability to manage soil carbon towards net zero emissions. I am from the CGIR and the University of Vermont. I will give a brief introduction. So we know that in order to achieve the 1.5 degree goal, uh, for which we need to reach zero emissions in 2050, that we need to achieve about two to five more times carbon sequestration in the land use sector. This includes both soil and above ground biomass, in other words, forestation, agroforestry. And fortunately, we also know that soils can contribute about two to five gigatons or billions of tons of CO2 equivalents per year um, in theory. And if we look at the economic potential, about one billion tons per year. So they can contribute quite substantially to that, that need to increase carbon sequestration by two to five times. Of course, the extent, to, the extent of sequestration possible will be a function of the area that can be achieved as well as the rate of sequestration. And so, for example, we will have high potentials in grazing lands and cropland areas where we have very large areas but maybe marginal amounts of, of sequestration um, compared to, say, uh, restoring organic soils where we have high impact but relatively small areas. In addition to reducing the emissions from the atmosphere and storing them in the soil, we also would like to be able to protect the existing carbon in the soil, which is actually vastly greater, where we have about 680 billion tons of carbon. And about 10 countries hold more than 60% of that total soil carbon stock. So first and foremost, we need to think about protecting what we have, and then we can also think about trying to sequester more carbon in the soil. But achieving the latter is not easy. And, and I think that's one of the reasons why it's such a hot topic and why there's a lot of interest in improving the amount of soil carbon. Uh, first, there's no guarantee that what we add to the soil will stay there. Agriculture is inherently a driver of soil carbon loss. For it to store soil carbon, we need constant inputs of carbon. So we need to sustain that over long periods of time. And of course, if you change the practices and don't have those inputs, you can lose, lose what you've gained. Also, a lot of the projections of soil carbon sequestration have been at the global scale and, and produce very significant, impressive numbers. But there are very real biophysical limits to some of those changes, as well as, of course, the socioeconomic barriers um, in terms of incentives or inputs um, and land tenure. And finally, because soil is very context specific, uh, we need context specific solutions, which is, is not a low cost um, venture. So the, the real interest of this session is to look at what kinds of um, public policy and other incentives we can create. And if we look um, presently, we have a number of initiatives that are um, somewhat small in scale, but have great potential for, for scaling. Uh, first are the nationally determined contributions of the Paris Agreement. We have at least 35 different parties who've already committed, uh, cr created commitments to soil carbon, um, especially in the area of wetlands, agroforestry, and grassland management. Um, and this is data only from November, so we expect to see further increases. Um, and then the other initiatives are really about different forms of payments or different kinds of incentives. So uh, at the government level, uh, Australia has really been promoting uh, soil carbon sequestration through their carbon farming initiative. And in California, we have the Healthy Soils Program, which is combining both uh, subsidies for changing practices and demonstrations. In the private sector, Indigo's Terraton Initiative has been one of the major, major uh, pushes uh, with an uh, effort to combine the technical assistance together with the finance and the monitoring. And we have a number of corporations from Danone to, Myers, to Mars to Bayer, uh, Coca-Cola and Olam who are also working really hard to get up to speed in this area. And last, we have carbon market projects, uh, which we can expect to see, I think, increase in the future with the Kenya Ag Agricultural Carbon Project being one of the very first in this area and already having more than a decade of having stored carbon in the soil. 
But these are just a few examples, and we can imagine a much broader range of policy measures being implemented in the future, whether on the side of implementing different forms of land use, so conserving forest, peat, and grassland, uh, restoring degraded lands, regulating fertilizer, reducing burning, ensuring in, uh, urban waste reuse, or on the finance side, where we enhance the carbon market or create carbon prices and taxes, where we provide subsidies to redirect um, farmers' practices towards more soil carbon sequestration, where we create sustainable finance that is linked to criteria related to soil carbon sequestration, or where energy prices are managed to discourage farmers from using energy, for example, which supports no tillage. Um, Supporting all of this are a number of enabling conditions which need to be taken account of as well, whether considering the longevity of a policy to ensure permanence, uh, enabling technical advisories, or uh, providing the kind of accountability through MRV and um, information systems that allow us to track our gains. So with that very brief background, uh, the four questions that our wonderful panel are going to address are uh, first, what, what are the management options that can effectively sequester carbon? How can policymakers ensure that these are compatible with a range of other goals um, articulated especially by the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals? Are there potential, are there high impact, low cost options that we should be considering, these hot spots? And then finally, what kinds of policies are needed that would really enable us to reach the scale that we are interested in? So it is my great pleasure uh, to introduce the panel now. Uh, first, we'll have Hans Jolstin, uh, who's a professor from Griesfeld University and Griesfeld Meyer Center, who will talk to us about peatland. Uh, he will be followed by Claire Chenou, who's a professor and researcher from AgroParis Tech and the National Research Institute for Agriculture, Food and Environment, or INRE, in France. Uh, she'll be followed by Keith Fugley, who's an economist with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And we will conclude with Jonathan Brooks, who's head of division, the OECD Trade and Agriculture Directorate. And this panel was organized by the OECD. So let's turn over to Hans. Yes, here is the thing that I want to have. Okay, I hope you see everything. I want to talk today about peatlands as the emission hotspots of agriculture. As you all know, peatlands are lands with a peat soil, with an organic soil. And these peatlands in the world are major carbon stock. They contain 600 gigatons of carbon in their soils. That's an enormous amount. This is twice the carbon stock of all forest biomass, which means that 3% of the land that is peatland of the world uh, contains twice as much carbon as 30% of land that is uh, covered by forest. Peat is conserved underwater like gherkins. And if you drain it, if you dry it, it oxidizes to CO2 and it is so much uh, uh, carbon in it that it can be compared to a bomb. Drain peats currently emit more than two gigatons of CO2 equivalents. That means that 0.4% of the land area of this planet is responsible for 5% of global emissions. Most of these emissions come from agricultural peatlands, peatlands that are drained for agriculture. So palm oil is climate in the same way as potatoes on peatlands are climate and cows and milk on peatlands are climate. To give you an impression of the enor enormous extent of the emissions, if you take one kilogram of cheese produced from milk from cows on peatlands that contains 45 kilograms of CO2, and one liter of milk is equal to two liter of petrol. So the glass of milk that you drink at your breakfast, uh, you can at the same time uh, drink one liter of petrol. In the European Union, 3% of the agricultural land is responsible for 25% of all agricultural greenhouse gas emissions. It's a little bit complex graph, but the inner circle uh, contains the agricultural land, and the red stuff is the organic land, the land on peatlands. And these the outer circles are all emissions from agriculture, those from CO2 uh, and those 
from methane, from rice, but also from ruminants, and from nitrous oxide from fertilization. And then you see that in many countries, a very small area of agricultural land is responsible for a very large amount of total agricultural greenhouse gas emissions. Next to greenhouse gas emissions, peatland drainage leads also to nitrate pollutions of water, an enormous problem. Peatland drainage leads to subsidence, the lowering of the surface, and to consequent flooding. Peat drainage causes soil degradation and desertification that nothing can grow here anymore, like here in Ukraine. And peatland drainage leads to fire and haze with many heat uh, health effects. In the end, peatland drainage leads to the loss of productive land, and therefore peatland drainage has to stop. If we want to rewet, and that is what is necessary, we have some options. The Paris Agreement says that we have to reach net zero, and that means that we have to rewet all drained peatland of the world until 2050. And that is a large area. We have to rewet worldwide 2 million hectares per year from now on, half of which in Europe. And then the possibilities we have is to make these largely agricultural lands into new wet wildernesses, which can be very beautiful and very uh, useful, uh, or we create a wet type of agriculture, which we call paludiculture. Both of these rewetted systems provide important ecosystem services and may allow also payments for ecosystem services uh, for the farmers who rewet their land. But only polyticultures provide also biomass income. And what kind of biomass income you can think of? I give some examples. Reed for high quality construction material. Cattail for construction, fodder or packaging, a very diverse product. Jolutung in the tropics for high quality latex and chewing gum. Or sanju for medical purposes. One thing is clear. If you need to use peatlands, you have to use them wet uh, to prevent all kinds of climate damage. We have one big issue. These polluticultures are very promising, but their production chains are not yet fully operation, operational. We need still 10 to 15 years uh, to develop really sustainable and uh, productive uh, production chains. Yeah, but in the meantime, uh, we have, of course, to boost research and development of polluticultures, and we have to find ways to provide rapid income to farmers in case of wetting. And the solution for there is the carbon credits that ha have become very uh, expensive in the last years. Rewetting provides fast and large emission reductions that can provide income to farmers. So you have to give farmers emission rights that they may sell or may not sell and you have to guarantee a price for carbon credits. And then you may let them choose either to continue dry without carbon credits or by wet agriculture with income from carbon credits. Hans, I'm afraid we have to end your I presentation have, to move uh, on. You have to stop then the emission rights in 2045, and then the farmer can buy emission rights or his emissions have to be zero, and then it will run. Peatlands must be wet for the climate, for the land, for the people forever. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hans. Now we will turn to Claire Chenou. So, yes, good afternoon. So let me share my screen. I guess it's okay. So I'm Claire Chenou, I'm a soil scientist. As Lini said, I'm working at INRAE AgroParisTech and I'm, the coordinate, I'm coordinating the European Joint Program Soil and a member of the Proper Meal Scientific and Technical Committee. Managing land use and soils towards net zero emission encompasses First, as it was uh, presented, protecting the existing large carbon stocks in forests or in soils, such as, for example, we just heard about peatland, as, as you can see on high latitudes on this map. Agricultural soils now, as you see on the top right map, are often have very low soil organic carbon stocks because, and this you can see it on the uh, right 
um, bottom uh, map because they have historically lost most of their uh, carbon because of inappropriate uh, management. Hence, they have lost their carbon and there is a large potential here by storing additional carbon via appropriate management options. Well, such options have been identified. The efficient lever is actually to increase primary production per unit surface area and increase the fraction of this primary production that returns to soil. We green the soils with vegetation everywhere all the time cover crops, grassing intervals in vineyards and orchards, agroforestry, temporary lays in croplands. A wide perspective is needed, not only focus on carbon sequestration, but also consider the other ecosystem services, uh, provisioning food, fiber, biomass, regulating erosion, supporting biodiversity, storing and recycling water. We may expect all that from soils. So attention is needed between the trade-offs about um, on trade-offs and synergies between the different functions on, of soils. The climate smart management options that you have depicted here as photographs are sustainable management options. They maintain food production, they foster soil health. We definitely need to place soil carbon sequestration in a wide context. Regarding climate change mitigation, we have to consider with equal importance the reduction of N2 emissions by soils, for example, by reducing adjusting fertilization. We need to identify and address the trade-offs between carbon and nitrogen and account uh, for additional N2 emissions that may occur and that are, for example, represented here on this synthesis of different meta-analyses. Going back to carbon sequestration, we have fair estimates of how much additional carbon you can store in a given soil, for at least for some um, pedoclimatic context and for a range of management options. But now what we need, and Lini uh, discussed about, uh, thought about that, are estimates of what is technically achievable. In what can you achieve in a given territory, landscape, country? In the AJP soil, we performed a survey and we found that 14 European countries have estimated their technical potential for reducing national greenhouse gas emissions in agricultural soils by storing additional carbon. And you can see that these countries have either modeled, estimated the impact of one management option, you see only one color for Switzerland, Spain, Norway, or UK, or by virtually implementing different management options and you see different colors. Now, we are currently, but this was obtained with different methods. There's no unified methodology. So now in the AJP soil, we are using a unified either tier two or tier three methodology to estimate the carbon sequestration potential of 23 uh, European uh, countries. The next step after the technical potential is to estimate the economic soil organic carbon sequestration potential, how much you can store if you give, a, if you set the plateau in terms of cost of the additional stored carbon. And you see an example at the national scale uh, for France here. Now, are there hotspots to prioritize? Well, I think that degraded, restoring degraded soil is a priority. And I will take one example. There are many examples, but I will take one, that of black soils. Black soils are widespread over continents. They represent nearly 200 million hectares, 90% of world agricultural soils. They are very fertile soils when they're rich in organic matter. So they provide a good share of the global food basket, but they have lost 20 to 50% of the organic carbon with inappropriate management options. And they are now degraded, erosion, nutrient imbalance, compaction, loss of biodiversity, salinization. So that, Increasing, restoring these soils by increasing the amounts of organic matter returned to them would allow to recover fertility. It has a cost, but the benefits are huge. Now, policies are needed to alleviate the barriers to implementation. First, support and advice for the, um, for the land managers and farmers uh, are, is needed, and this also needs to be considered uh, in, po in policies, and in particular to tackle the um, difficulties uh, the, with um, carbon storage, the timescale, slow dynamic, the issue of permanence, leakage issues, trade-offs, 
accounting the technical difficulties of accounting so organic carbon changes to set fair and functional policies and incentives. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Claire, for highlighting that greening of the soils and is in some options for doing so, but also some of the trade-offs and, and obstacles that need to be overcome. Okay, now we'll turn to Keith Fugley, please. Thank you, Lena. Well, my name is Keith Fugley. I'm an economist with the Department of Agriculture. I would like to take a few minutes this morning to discuss the importance of raising agricultural productivity to limit land use change and greenhouse gas emissions in global agriculture. Next slide, please. When we think of agriculture, we should really think of it as a knowledge-driven industry, where we invest, both the public and private sectors invest in research and development to generate the kinds of technologies that Hans and Claire described, that farmers adopt to raise productivity and conserve natural resources. Now, in this figure, I'm just showing the growth, uh, kind of decomposing where growth in agricultural output globally came from over the last 60 years. How much of that growth came from expanding land and agriculture? That's in the green. How much of it came from extending irrigation to cropland? And in the yellow or beige is how much of the growth came from increasing inputs per acre. So that's more land, labor, and capital, more fertilizers per acre of land in, in production, input intensification. And then the gray part is what we call growth from increasing total productivity of all those inputs, the land, labor, and capital, or total factor productivity. And that's really the knowledge-driven component of growth. It comes from adoption of new technologies, improved farming practices that allows you to get basically more output from the resources employed in production. And especially since the 1990s, that's actually been the primary way in which food production globally has grown around the world. Next slide, please. Now, so as we raise productivity, we can save on the resources being used in production, and that also saves on the environmental inputs, such as greenhouse gas emissions. So here I'm just showing contrasting high-income and low-income countries, and their, 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 the pattern of growth in the use of inputs, total land, labor, and capital inputs in green, and total outputs of crop and livestock commodities in, group, in blue. And then I've overlaid that with total amount of greenhouse gas emissions from agricultural production in orange. In high-income countries, uh, emissions have actually declined with uh, total income, uh, total resources. There's less land, less capital, less labor being used in agriculture today than there was 30 years ago, even as output has grown. And that's because of increases in productivity. So productivity has really substituted for those farm inputs as well as emissions. In low-income countries, productivity has also grown. Output is growing faster than inputs, but inputs are still growing and so emissions are still increasing. And so we look to accelerating productivity growth as one important strategy for conserving resources and in reducing this environmental footprint of agriculture. Uh, next slide, please. I've been doing some simulations with some colleagues at Purdue University to look at how policies might contribute to slowing the growth of global land uh, use in agriculture as a way of conserving greenhouse gas emissions. And one of the policies we've looked at is accelerating investments in research and development to get higher productivity. And one of our scenarios shows that this could cut the projected expansion of global cropland by half by 2050. And then finally, my last slide, please. We've also looked at, now one of the problems with, an, with the productivity policy is that while you're conserving land, you may not be conserving the particular land that you want to, the kinds of high carbon potential land that that Jans, that Hans talked about, the peatlands or the Claire described, the tropical forests. And so we've also looking at, well, how does this policy compare with environmental policies that that target payments to farmers or to owners of that kind of land to compensate them for foregone income from agricultural production so they don't use that to removing that land from production. 
Now, that can be very effective at cutting land use expansion and reducing emissions, but it comes at a cost of lower agricultural output, perhaps higher food prices, which may exacerbate global food insecurity. So a scenario that actually combines environmental policies with more rapid productivity growth through R&D could result in actually a reduction in cropland in global agriculture by 2050 without increases in, in crop prices and maybe a more food insecure, a more food secure world. So this is just to illustrate, I think, the important role that productivity growth can play in leading to a future where we have a more sus environmentally sustainable agriculture, as well as meeting their global food security needs into the future. Thank you very much. Back to you, Lini. Thank you, Keith. So we have options for enhancing productivity while maintaining some of our environmental values. Thanks for those different scenarios. Uh, and finally, our last panel panelist is Jonathan Brooks from the OECD. Thanks very much, uh, Lini, and thanks to, to the other speakers for the expertise that they brought to this session. It's an honor for OECD to be, organize this session and to benefit from uh, a particular range of scientific knowledge. We're not soil scientists, but we are interested in how science can be combined with policy to help us address these formidable challenges that the food system faces in terms of providing food security, nutrition, uh, livelihoods to more than 600 million farmers worldwide, managing natural resources, and then adapting to a mitigating climate change. And the previous speakers have, have made the point that, that soils can be part of the solution to these global challenges as an input to sustainable and resilient food systems and as a carbon sink. Um, and also there are win-wins with soil carbon strip sequestration tending to improve the environmental performance of agriculture, notably in terms of biodiversity. And it was great to see from, uh, from Hans and from Claire some practical examples of the ways in which those technical solutions can work. But as they also made clear, those, those technical possibilities need the correct policy signals in place for them to be harnessed in, uh, effectively. Um, in particular, productivity enhancing investments and conservation measures, measures should be seen as complements, a, a point that Keith made very effectively. Um, in a new OECD report published on Monday, uh, my colleagues Ben Henderson and UC Lankowski, in collaboration with researchers at Scotland's Rural College, have identified ways in which the policy environment can support those technical steps uh, that, that are so essential. And they've started from the point that Sequestration on agricultural lands could offset 4% of about 4% of annual global human induced emissions over the rest of the century. So that's about one tenth of the reduction needed to meet the two degrees Celsius target set out in the Paris Agreement. But they note that for that potential to be realized, a number of other policies need to be put in place. So it requires regulations to prevent the use of unsustainable practices that cause soil carbon losses, including restrictions on the drainage and conversion of peatland soils. It includes knowledge transfer mechanisms to exploit the potential for agronomic uh, measures to raise both carbon stocks and to provide profits for farmers. So that's a win-win. And then market policies in the form of either taxes or abatement subsidies. But getting those policies to work means overcoming some hurdles, and some of those have been mentioned uh, already. Uh, one is non-permanence. So soil carbon stops, stocks are built up gradually, but they can be lost very quickly. And establishing contracts to maintain stocks over time poses a challenge for designing contracts and for measuring reporting and verification. Uh, it also entails transaction costs that need to be reduced in order to speed up implementation and compliance. And then in order to be cost effective, policies need to be paying for additionality, i.e. beyond what farmers and landowners would do under a business as usual scenario. Now, that's complicated stuff. It's not trivial to make it work effectively. And researchers and policy analysts will no doubt a lot, have a lot on their hands looking at the most effective modalities for making those policies work. But I'd just like to conclude with one final point about the broad overall balance of policy effort. 
Um, each year we, we do a, a kind of stock take in our monitoring of agricultural policies across 54 countries, including all the major agricultural economies. And those calculations show that across 54 countries, about $447 billion of taxpayers' money is spent on supporting the agricultural sector. But of that, only $75 billion is spent on investments in research and development, in biosecurity and innovation, in ways that have the potential to raise productivity in the ways that Keith pointed out are so essential. And then a mere 1.5 billion is spent on ecosystem services, including for the provision of improved soil quality. So it's, it's trivial in the overall balance of policy effort. The, the remainder is spent on ways that on balance make the problems worse, not better, and don't contribute to healthy soils and sustainable development. So I think there's a specific case for action on soils that sits within a much wider case for a form of agricultural policies and a repurposing of public monies to invest in productive, sustainable, and resilient uh, agricultural and food systems. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll hand back to you, Lini. Thanks. Thank you, Jonathan, for bringing us back to the big picture and OECD's especially uh, latest report and analysis of these issues. So now we have about 20, 25 minutes for questions. And I'd like to encourage any of the participants to please put your questions into the Q&A box. Um, and I may need the technical team's advice because I, I'd like to be able to see that on the uh, online version. Um, but just to get us started, um, one question would be, we are on a timeline. There is some urgency to addressing these issues and particularly to achieving sequestration in the next 10 years, right, by 2030. Uh, if each of you had to either highlight an existing initiative that you think is particularly promising that's happening right now as a model or an action that you think needs to be taken that will achieve real results by 2030, uh, what would that be? Yes, I could start about talk, uh, talking about the AJP, where we are, uh, I think, estimating the technical potential for storing additional carbon is really important in that it has the po possibility to convince policymakers, to convince uh, government uh, that there is there is a possibility. And now we need, of course, it's not enough. We need to also estimate the, the um, economic potential. And we also need to estimate, and this is missing, what is feasible, what is socially acceptable, culturally acceptable. And this is, we do not have uh, straightforward methods to estimate that. So I think, yes, this would be one point. And I would, yes, I, of course, I will cite the uh, Four Per Mil Initiative, which I think in terms of our awareness raising, has really um, can be a st very strong lever. Hand it over to you, Dini. Yeah, thank you, Claire. Great points. But anybody else? If, if I could just uh, chime in a little bit there, uh, Lini. You know, one of the things about productivity policy research and development is actually it it takes there's a long gestation time involved from when you start doing the research, developing technologies, and then getting them widely adopted by farmers. I mean, Hans pointed out that, you know, the paddy culture that he described, or paddy culture may take another 10 to 15 years to develop. So these are long-term investments, mm -hmm. really necessary investments, hard to sustain them sometimes when they, politically, when you think about the payoffs are that far in the future. But those are, I think those are the real long-term solutions that, that will, you know, make uh, pro agricultural profitable in a way for both farmers and consumers and in the way that's environmentally sustainable. But in the near term, to get those uh, results in, uh, you know, in the next five or 10 years, will probably take more direct intervention in the form of uh, subsidies for current, for, you know, for adoption of certain practices that conserve soil carbon, uh, that uh, prevent the expansion of agriculture on, uh, in tropical forests or peatlands where there's a lot of carbon emissions taking place, as well as policies to encourage adoption of technologies that are sort of on the shelf um, um, so that farmers can get quick gains in productivity. And particularly in many developing countries where extension systems are rather weak, 
uh, and um, and um, you know technology delivery systems uh, could be beefed up to try to get uh, more rapid adoption of, of technologies that will raise productivity of, of, of ex on farms. Thank you. Hans, did you Maybe want to... I have some comments about uh, peatland rewetting. I have addressed the aspect of peatland rewetting that is uh, associated with avoided emissions. The emissions from drain peatlands are enormous and they can very rapidly be stopped by rewetting. Uh, to find a economic a um, uh, carrier for wetting uh, would be polluting culture, but as I said, this needs development. But on the short term, uh, this transition can be supported uh, by the emission reductions that you are creating and the carbon credits that you may sell. From the perspective of sequestration, there is a very interesting thing. We have done a, a wide research in that in areas that have been rewetted over the past decades. And it appears to be that in the first 10 years after rewetting, there is an enormous amount of carbon stored in the new anoxic layer that is created by the rewetting. It is much more than the annual sequestration rate of living peatlands, because this is rather low. But this first phase filling up a new anoxic layer that has newly been created by rewetting is really a dump of carbon. So that is on the short term a gain also of peatland rewetting. Fascinating. Good to know. Uh, Joschen, we have a question for you from the audience. Uh, what is the conversion factor of methane that you used calculated on the 20 years? To whom was it? Yeah, that was to you, Joschen. To me? Yes. The conversion factor of methane that you used calculated on the 20 years. I imagine that's for the potential. If you calculate uh, for 20 years, you have to uh, use the high one, uh, 78 or what is it, uh, or 98. Uh, Actually, we do this. I, I did not uh, talk about that, but uh, uh, if you want to really to address the effect of peatland rewetting and the interference of carbon dioxide, uh, which is a, uh, a weak uh, greenhouse gas with a very long uh, residence time in the atmosphere and compare it with the effect of methane, which is a very strong greenhouse gas, for, certainly on the short run, but has only a, a, a lifetime of 12.7 year, uh, years in the atmosphere. Atmosphere, uh, then you have to work with radiative forcing and, and uh, really model these things. And then it appears to be, we have uh, published uh, last year about that in Nature Communications, that every time, uh, if you have to choose between CO2 from drain peatlands or methane from rewetted peatlands, because you induce methane generation again, then you always have to choose for the methane, because within 10 to 20 years, uh, the CO2 is going to win as a climate burden from the methane because of these different uh, lifetimes in the atmosphere. Yeah, it's a really important point um, that we're considering not just CO2 here, but also methane and that it behaves differently in the atmosphere. Okay, nitrous another... oxide is, of course, nitrous oxide is, of course, a very heavy greenhouse gas with a very long uh, residence time, and that is also the product of a drainage, and it is stopped by rewetting. Yeah, Claire. Yes, I wanted to add uh, one aspect that I think is quite frequently overlooked. Of course, uh, incentives, monetary incentives are absolutely needed. It has a cost to implement new management options. But I think in policy, maybe more attention should be given to better knowledge transfer. And for example, it was a, there was a very interesting questionnaire, Re Reza Monda, I think it was 3,000 farmers in Europe uh, about carbon sequestration and the barriers. And among the most cited answers were that they were not able to appreciate the benefits from, for themselves, the farmers, in, um, of storing additional carbon. So this is an area where knowledge transfer is needed. And I would say more widely training and capacity building, fostering networks among farmers. And this can be implemented quite rapidly. So I think it could bring short-term benefits in addition to economical incentives. So recognizing that we need the productivity and, and co-benefits, but also that they're enabling conditions that will support that, yes. and, and particularly on capacity building and awareness. Thank you. Okay, maybe, so, maybe. Yeah, sorry, please, maybe. Jonathan. Well, maybe, Lynn, if I, I, you know, if I could just support that point, I, I think that that looks like a like an easy uh, an easy win, and uh, and the work the work that my colleagues have done, they they've suggested that there's there's work on protecting 
existing stocks would it would be something that would be yeah. a priority and something that would be relatively something that could where action could be taken fairly swiftly now ultimately that needs harmonized measurement but they their their, their analysis suggests that grants can help with suitable conditions uh, attached compliance addition, uh, uh, conditions attached um but uh, the other point i think this echoes what, what claire was saying is that there are kind of windows when when there are policy reform opportunities come along and so, for example in europe we're seeing countries developing their national plans for implementation of the common agricultural policy and again many of the policies are working in the in the wrong direction and mm. A little of the policy effort is going in the right direction. Mm. Claire suggested something there that, in the big scheme of things, costs very little and can deliver something something very quickly. So, even a kind of fairly modest shift in the the policy balance could could have quite a big impact in mm. in that regard. So, taking advantage of those policy windows is is important. We have a question from the audience. Um, how can we effectively, and this relates to the question of protecting existing soils, how can we effectively and quickly ensure that fertile soils are no longer sealed for construction and transport <coughs> projects? Um, so that uh, we're, or that fertile loess soils are not, um, I think the word here may be mined for lignite as in the, or used for lignite as in the case in the Rhineland in Germany. For example, would a ban on the sale of Garden soil with peat be a possible approach and how to get there quickly. Mm. Would anybody like to respond to that? Well, maybe I can try. Well, uh, this is a very complex problem and uh, this is the main threat on soils, for example, in Europe and in many uh, areas. And yes, cities have, have always developed uh, on fertile soils because the prosperity came from that. So of course it's policy for pure urbanization, policy for city development, um, analyzing and uh, studying how city can be rebuilt on former industrial or uh, sealed um, surfaces rather than on uh, agricultural land. But also I think that, um, you know, the land managers, the urbanists, they clearly say that they lack instruments to be able to orient the urbanization considering soils. They do not have the instruments to help them to choose this soil rather than this one in terms of provided ecosystem services to, to place, you know, to geographically place uh, urbanization and seeding. So there's also here a need for more knowledge and a need for knowledge development. And, and again, for uh, training and capacity building of uh, maybe not, not farmers, but uh, urbanists, uh, uh, land managers, uh, another community. Thank you. So we have a very interesting question about how to take an integrated approach from the three strands of work presented by the panelists. In other words, how can we bring together peatland conservation and rewetting with the greening the soils with increasing productivity? Are there opportunities for um, somehow making these different policies or creating a policy that would enable these to work together? What kinds of frameworks would we need? Yeah, yeah. Uh, of course, you have to change existing frameworks to a large extent. Uh, the example, for example, if a farmer uh, wants to change uh, the, the cultivation of, of mice, of, of corn on drained peatlands into the cultivation of reed on, 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 on rewetted peatlands, it are both grasses, you, you can both use them uh, for the same purpose, bioenergy, for example, uh, they, they, they have the same productivity. Then this initiative is blocked by the fact that reed is not acknowledged to be an agricultural crop. So the direct payments that farmers get in the European Union are stopped by changing to another crop. And that is yeah, the heritage of the past that uh, the, the rules have not made from the perspective of innovative thinking. And this is a major uh, 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 prevention of, of the implementation of good solutions. So we have to, to look at these things, where are the barriers that have to be changed? And sometimes they can very easily be changed that you say, okay, then we include that in, in the list of crops. And then this uh, barrier is gone. Thank you. Anyone if else? I could come in there too, um, you know, I think, you know, we've talked a lot about economic incentives, uh, carbon payments. Um, these things create incentives, not only to adopt existing practices, 
but they create incentives and innovation as well. And you know, if 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 producers are rewarded for conserving carbon, or if they're penalized for for farming soils that are emitting a lot of carbon, that it creates an, an innovation environment where you know to create the where where innovators, both in the public and private sectors, also have greater incentives to develop the kinds of technologies that will uh, have you know that will produce farming practices that will enhance soil carbon and and allow farming in a way that's that's environmentally sustainable. So getting prices right is really important for technology adoption, but also technology development. Jonathan. Yeah, maybe, you know, maybe if I can just build on, on Keith's points, because I mean, he made the point about uh, the, the paramounts of, of raising agricultural productivity. So there are quite a lot of neutral incentives. They're not directly related to carbon stocks, but investments in agricultural research in building uh, agricultural uh, infrastructure uh, to raise productivity. These things, these things can have, have an important kind of neutral effect. But then the kind of points that, that Hans was suggesting, you know, the first thing there is to is to do no harm, right? To to remove the policies that create perverse incentives, and if they're uh, if they're if they're incentivizing uh, uh, unsustainable exploitation of the of the soil and land, then then getting rid of ineffective policies, I'd say, is important. And you know, at the same time, shifting those resources onto paying directly for the public good benefit of of, of sequestration, as he uh, and and also Keith just Keith set out. Yeah, really important point. So, so we now have a question from the audience that gets at one of the underlying assumptions of the productivity stream of work, which is, is there a trade-off between increasing the productivity proposed by Mr. Fugley and the increasing sequestration that we'd like to achieve, since it seems that soils have lost carbon during periods of strong um, productivity growth? So, so I'd ask, you know, if that is the case, what do we need to do differently? Well, it is true that whenever you farm soils, um, you have tended to see reductions in um, soil carbon uh, compared to their natural state. And that's true whether it's a very low, uh, you know, low input agriculture or high input agriculture. Um, there is, uh, but though there are a lot of examples of um, innovations that have been both profitable for farmers to adopt and that have resulted in high productivity with uh, increasing carbon stocks. Now, Claire talked about some of the potential innovations, but even if you look at something like no-till agriculture, which is um, widely used, especially in the Western hemisphere, where you, you've seen that with the adoption of this technology, uh, and sometimes it's associated with, uh, you know, where you're basically substituting uh, mechanical tillage with chemical tillage uh, to control weeds, but you're, but without that, without that tillage, you're able to really enhance soil carbon. So that's an example of a technology that's been both profitable for farmers to use, uh, re resulted in, you know, high, high productivity and has increased soil, uh, soil sequestration or soil carbon stocks compared to a production practice where you're tilling the soil annually. Now, it's still not as much as if you had those soils in a natural forest or grassland state. So that's 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 why it's also very important to have higher productivity to reduce the total amount of land in agriculture, but especially those, you know, avoiding agriculture in lands that have tremendous capacity to sequester carbon and other greenhouse gases, such as, you know, protect peatlands and protect tropical forests. Thank you. So, so now we have a question about um, carbon credits, uh, saying it's not just about knowledge transfer, it's also how can, carb how can farmers sell the carbon credits they generate, how to accurately calculate these credits based on the French method, and apologies, I cannot pronounce this properly, but uh, la, la belle ba basse carbone? La belle bas carbone. You were Thank very you. right. Yeah, very Thank good. <laughs> so how, how can we support farmers to sell carbon credits? What needs to be done? Uh, 
Now, you have to offer very suitable MRV systems yes. that you monitor, report, and verify these things. Uh, you have to develop methods to do these things, indicators, et cetera, et cetera. We have done these things, of course, for, for, for peatland rewetting, uh, where we use uh, vegetation, uh, herbs, et cetera, as indicators for, for emissions that is possible. Uh, in the end, we have to come, of course, to a remote sensing approach that we can easily monitor these things. And these developments are underway. Uh, the, the satellite uh, possibilities are uh, every month increasing, uh, but we have to uh, develop reliable MRV uh, capacity, otherwise uh, a market will not run. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would like to, to support this statement and say that, for example, yes, MRV of soil carbon is indeed uh, difficult um, because carbon stocks change slowly. It is kind of costly. It is costly to measure. There's high spatial variability. But a combination of different approaches uh, is needed to, to set efficient systems. And for example, in the example of the label bas carbone for uh, cropping areas, what is proposed is a mixed system that combines modeling with measurements. Not, uh, well, you have initial measurements and measurements after 10 years, but do not spend too much money in measuring uh, often. And again, yes, uh, high throughput and low cost methods uh, associated with remote sensing are necessary and I think they will de really develop. Now, for also for it to be um, adopted by, by farmers, I have the impression, it's in my area, that the scale is not the individual farmers. I'm not sure that it will be easy uh, in terms of um, burden of the uh, administrative uh, aspect of that, of implementing the MRV. It's not at the scale of the individual farmer, but maybe groups of farms. So they probably there's a need to find the proper scale and it has to be rewarded enough to be adopted. Otherwise, and the farmers will be right if they don't adopt it, if it's not a good reward. And aggregating farmers sometimes allows that reward to be that much larger yeah. and incentivized when it might not be large enough at, this, at the farm scale. Thank you. Okay, uh, perhaps our final or second to final question. Uh, we but, have thanks, thanks for a very. Oh, I'm sorry. Did somebody want to? Yes, but in? maybe you, Lini, you you did not. Uh, you uh, maybe you wanted to comment on that, on the uh, on the question on the carbon farming and adoption by farmers. Yeah. So I do feel that we have um, this combination of modeling and MR modeling and measurement um, that we can use. There is the concern that you can only note the changes in soil carbon after a certain period of time, whether that's three years, five years, or possibly even longer. And so what do you pay farmers in the meantime, year by year, and how do you get that initial incentive, you know, for farmers um, soon enough, if you're only really able to detect a change in soil carbon uh, after three to five years? So, so I think um, you're absolutely right that it is about initially at least modeling and probably averaging out the changes. Uh, it's also about um, having larger scale change and then um, aggregating it and, and dividing up the, the benefits. That's what they've done, for example, in the Kenya Agricultural Carbon Project. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think it's also about having buffers or discounts so that if you don't achieve the amount of carbon measured, that uh, there's an initial di discount. And if you go beyond that, then you get an additional payment. And if you don't meet it, then, then that's fine. Okay. Our, thank you, Claire. Our final question is, um, first a comment, thank you for a very insightful session. Can you point to critical research gaps that need to be addressed, both within basic soil science and management practices? Do we know enough to reach the carbon potential? Go ahead, Claire. Yes, that was a very interesting paper. I'm sorry, I do not remember the name of the first author uh, recently that made an analysis of where were performed studies on soil carbon sequestration. And it showed, well, it's not surprising, but a very strong bias towards Northern countries and uh, yes, America and Europe and really a lack of studies in um, tropical countries and in Africa especially. So I think, I would say that the priority is to perform studies in these areas and, and maybe also in uh, semi-arid areas where I have the impression that there's not enough and where the benefit in terms of food security can be important. This is what is sometimes named um, uh, bright spots 
the 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 uh, additional carbon storage potential is not that high, but the surface area is so large and it's so important for people's lives that maybe, yeah, I would put that as priority. Thank you. Hans, do you want to comment on the research needs from the peatland side? Yeah, of course, uh, important is anyhow uh, what methane is doing. Uh, so we have to, uh, we know more and more about methane. It, uh, in, in the past, it was always mentioned as the big danger. Uh, we know now that it is not that bad, uh, also from this time issue. We know also that we can manage uh, the methane emissions by different types of plants, by different types of water management, by different types of, uh, of chemical, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but that we do have to develop because methane is, of course, a strong gas, and we have to prevent everything that gets into the atmosphere extra. And we will reduce uh, emissions of CO2 and nitrous oxide without problems, but we get methane, and we have to reduce that. And this this balancing of things, this optimizing, is is an interesting also. Uh, Type, uh, to topic of research, also for practical implement uh, implementation. Thank you. So this is the reminder to our audience before you sign off that there is a, an opportunity to meet with the panelists in a deep dive session uh, right after this. Um, but before we conclude, I'd like to turn over to Jonathan for final yeah. remarks. Well, just, I mean, yeah, I, I wouldn't try to, to conclude all this. There was a, a lot of... Uh, uh, great insights really i think as i said at the start it was it was very you know helpful indeed to have all this scientific knowledge and then to to also have uh, on top of that a perspective about how those how those technical aspects can can be brought to bear and about getting the policy settings right so that uh, uh, so that these these steps can be taken as as quickly as quickly as possible um uh, one, one, perhaps one final thought to, to conclude on. I, I made a broad point about structuring structuring policies, and uh, uh, it's important to bear in mind. I mean, agriculture we know is is the source of kind of a lot of problems in the world sometimes, but you know it does it does provide food security. It does provide nutrition. We have farmers who are custodians of the of the land. Um, they do provide a lot of benefits as well. And if we're looking at how we design programs so that they can deliver soil uh, sequestration, there are other benefits that they can provide that are joint with these benefits as well, including improving diverse biodiversity on their land. So kind of looking at the kinds of policy packages that we can introduce that get this goal consistently with other objectives for uh, the food and agriculture system is, is very important to us. Um, I think a lot of points were made about the need for improved measurement uh, at OECD, we're, we're strongly interested in anything that can lead to more harmonized measurement uh, across countries. And so if there's ways in which uh, we can facilitate that, that process, of course, we'd be, we'd be delighted to do it. And uh, I think, as I said at the outset, it was, it's an honor and a privilege really for us at the policy side of things to benefit from this scientific knowledge that means that when we do come to uh, looking at practical policies, we can be we can be more precise and bring the, the correct scientific expertise to bear. So I think with that, I'll, I'll leave it to you and I'll, I'll look forward to listening to, to the experts and the deep dives. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you to OECD for organizing this. Thank you to our technical team and to the audience. Have a good afternoon. Good evening. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks, Lenny. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.